Good morning. If you have a Bible, or if you have a way to access your Bible today, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke, the fifth chapter, Luke's Gospel, chapter five today. When you walk into the building, uh, you see a couple of signs. It uh, contains our vision statement for First Baptist Church. It's, we're here to help people find God and be changed and make a difference. And this is the year, um, let's see, what year is it? 2020. And in 2020, we want to talk about the vision for our church and what God has put us here to do. And part of that is that we exist to help people find God. And this morning, we're beginning officially this part of the year to talking about what does it look like in our lives to do this thing that, that God has created this church to do, that, that God has created you and me in part to do, and that is to help people find God. Now, the fancy word for this is the word evangelism. Now, you may have gone to church before a lot, and you've heard this word a lot, or maybe you're uh, new to church, and you don't know this word, or you, be, you might be like my three kids. My three kids, they have grown up going to church, and their dad is a pastor, and I asked my boys the other day, I was like, hey guys, what is evangelism? And they're like, huh? <laughs> so they know what it is, they just don't know what the word means. So this morning, what I thought I'd do is just start out by like giving you an understanding of this word real quickly. If, if you want to know what a word is, what do you do? You Google it, and when you Google it, you find the dictionary, and the dictionary tells you, this is Miriam Webster, whoever that is, right? tells you that this word, evangelism, is a noun. Now, for those of you in school, that's a person, place, or thing. And the first two definitions are these. Number one, it is the winning or the revival of personal commitments to Christ. So evangelism is about, like, it has something to do with winning people to Jesus. Now, you can tell that they don't really like this word down there at Merriam-Webster, because the second definition is militant or crusading zeal. Like it's, you picture somebody that's crazy running around making everybody become followers. I like the first definition, not the, the second one. But I really don't like the definition. Like a lot of words in the dictionary, you don't have enough information there to even understand what it even means. So here's a little bit better definition I found when I was Googling it. And this is uh, from somebody's you know, slide that they were showing at their church, and it was like, hey, this is a pretty good definition. Evangelism is the process of communicating the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way that leads to a personal relationship with Jesus that produces spiritual life and leads to discipleship. I love that definition. Only problem is, like if I told you that this morning and, and then asked you when we went out in the hallway, what is evangelism? You'd go, well, it's a bunch of words. You put it up on the screen. I can't remember. So what is a simpler definition? So I found this one. This is Leif Anderson's definition, the simple definition of evangelism. Those who know telling those who don't. Now, in my life, the most spiritual things that ever happened to me happened to me around that sacred spiritual object called the coffee maker. That's not a joke, y'all. I mean, that's serious stuff, right? The coffee maker. And so this week in our office, we go into the, you know, in our office, I'm, I'm, I'm going in to make some coffee by the Keurig coffee maker. And Colin, who you saw up here just a moment ago, leading us on the guitar over there, is our IT guy. And he does all of our technology. He creates our our he creates these things that go up on the screen, and Colin's like, midweek, he's like, Pastor, do you have your sermon stuff done so I can put it together? And I said, no, I'm still trying to figure out a simple way of articulating, like, what is evangelism? He said, well, at this church I used to go to, uh, see life, he said, they had a definition for evangelism that went like this, found people, find people. I was like, that is so good, I'm gonna steal that and say that's my own. <laughs> so from now on, you hear me say that, I came up with that, okay? Found people, find people. Like if, if you found God in your life or God has found you, 
Like one of the things that happens is, is you begin to share that faith or found people find people. And that's what that means out there in the hallway, that our church is here to help people find God. Because found people, those of you who found Jesus, your job now is to help other people find God. Found people find people. So where do we get this idea of evangelism from? Well, we get it from the Bible, actually. We get it especially from Jesus. When, when, I was, uh, when I was in college, I took a class on evangelism, believe it or not. And one of the books in that class was written by a guy named Robert Coleman. It's the book called The Master Plan of Evangelism. The book has sold three and a half million copies. And Billy Graham, the most famous American evangelist of the 20th century, wrote the foreword in this book. The guy that wrote it was the dean of the School of Evangelism at Wheaton and Gordon-Conwell Two huge schools. And in this book, what he does is he just asks a question. He says, if I'm going to do this thing that God's told me to do, found people, find people, evangelism, then isn't the best way to do it to say, how did Jesus do it, right? And so it's called the master's plan of evangelism, looking at what the master does. I'm not going to read you the whole book this morning. I'd encourage you to read it. It's a really simple, easy book to read. As the staff right now, we're reading it together again. A lot of us have read it many times. But I thought that's a great way for us this morning to begin, talking about helping people find God, is by thinking about what is the master's plan. So if you've got your Bible or a way to access your Bible, we're going to read from Luke 5, one of those moments in the gospel where Jesus shows us how important it is for found people to find people and begins to show us a little bit how we can do that. Luke 5, Jesus is going to the lake. It's kind of like lake day with Jesus in Luke 5. Now, that's probably where some of our church members are today. In Luke chapter 5, verse 1, it says, One day as Jesus was standing by the lake, here it's called Gennesaret. Another name for that is the Sea of Galilee. The people were crowding around him and they were listening to the word of God. People were coming to Jesus because Jesus was doing miracles and everyone was coming out to see Jesus. And so Jesus was talking to him. He was, he was teaching them. He saw at the water's edge, can you just picture Jesus there by the Sea of Galilee, two boats. They were left there, there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. They'd been out all night, they'd been, walk, they'd been fishing, didn't catch anything. He got into one of the boats. I think it's interesting, it doesn't say Jesus like asked permission, he just got in. The one belonging to Simon. Now if you don't know Simon, Simon's other name is Peter, Simon Peter, and he eventually will become one of Jesus' most important f- followers. The one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put, put it out a little from the shore, So he sat down in the boat, and he taught the people from the boat. So Jesus is sitting in the boat, teaching everybody. That's a pretty good teaching gig, if you ask me. But the reason he's doing that, if you kind of like know, it's because you can hear him well. It created a natural amplification system off the water for all the the people that were there listening to Jesus. Now, in verse 4, when he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, also called Peter, Put out into deep water. So apparently, like, Peter's in the boat with him at this point. And he said, let down the nets for a catch. Simon said, Master, we've worked hard all night. We haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Now, these are drag nets. These are huge, huge drag nets that were pulled between multiple boats. And these are things that are full of fish. So they signaled their partners. They had some partners in another boat who were dragging the net. By the way, their names were James and John. They, They signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and they filled both boats so full they began to sink. Now, that's a lot of fish. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' feet and he said, go away from me, Lord. Isn't it weird to say that to Jesus? Like he just did a miracle. I think if I was Peter at that point, I'd have been like, hey, let's go into business together, a fishing business, right? He's like, go away from me. But why is he saying that? He says, because I'm a sinful man. 
Like Peter knew that he was a sinner in the presence of a holy Jesus. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's business partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. You'll be a fisher of men and women. So they pulled their boats up onto the shore. They left everything. And they followed him. This is the moment when Peter becomes found. And now the one who is found begins to become one who finds others. Found people find people. This is described for us an example of what you might call the master's plan. This morning, if you've got your notes, you want to follow along. I just want to share with you just some simple things about how we are to understand, like how we share our faith. How do we help people find God? Well, the first thing we see in this passage, really, as we look at it and understanding the master's plan, is we realize that the master's plan is all about the people. It's all about the people. It's all about people, not programs or other things. In other words, today, if you and I were after the service, we were to get together and we were to go to Starbucks and we were to say, you know what, we're concerned about the fact that there are, there's 7.8 billion people on earth most of those people don't know about Jesus. Most of those people are not Christians. And we, and we want to reach those people. And we could just sit around and we'd, we'd drink a couple of cups of coffee and we would talk about how are we going to do that. And we'd say, hey, let's start this group and this group and they're going to go out and do this. And we build this big arsenal, this big army of volunteers and we're going to reach the whole world. It's not what Jesus did. Jesus said to one guy in a boat, follow me. I'll make you a fisher of men. In fact, in the Bible, we read about all the times Jesus spoke to the crowds, but how many disciples did he have? How many did he have? He had 12. He focused his attention in the lives of 12 individual people, and from those 12 people, they would reach thousands, and those thousands would eventually reach millions, and Christianity would grow from this tiny little group of people in this nowhere place until it spread across the world and today it is the greatest religion in the world. God's still interested in doing that in your life and my life. And if you and I would find him, truly find him in our lives, one of the things that would happen is that we would begin to want to help other people find him and then those people would be so captivated by Jesus that like Peter, they would get out of their boats and they would begin to want to help other people find him. If you were to follow Jesus around, we always get the impression that this would be the picture. Look at Jesus with the crowds. But look what Jesus does in this story. He turns his back on the crowds and he says, Peter, let's go out in the boat together. And let me just tell you something. You're not going to be just a fisherman. You are now going to be a fisher of men. He was interested in people. Let me tell you something that is just true. Anyone can invite anyone to church. It doesn't matter who you are, you can do that. At the beginning of the year, we've challenged all of our church members to invite at least one person every week, and I hope you'll do that, and I hope you've done that. I hope you'll continue to just invite people to come to church, because anyone can invite anyone to church. In fact, next week, somebody suggested, why don't you print up some like little business cards that have our church name on it, and on the back of it, just say, like, free pass. <laughs> like, you can come to our church for free, you know? So maybe we'll get some of those printed up. Next week you can, you can hand out, or we could maybe get golden tickets, you know, and you could pass those up. Anybody can invite anybody to church. I mean, you can walk out of here. You don't have to be a member of the church. You don't even have to know Jesus, and you can say, hey, come to church, right? Anybody can do that. And in fact, do you know that the people you know are the most likely ones to go to church if you invite them? Your friends and your family are the most likely ones to come to church if you invite them. But here's something that people sometimes say to me. The reason that they're like, oh, I don't know if I want to invite somebody to church. They say to me, they're, they worry about how people are going to treat them when they come to church. Rick Warren, the famous American pastor, has said that there are two reasons that people aren't Christians. One, they haven't met a Christian. Or two, they have. Does that make sense? 
There are some people that aren't Christians because no one has said, let me tell you about Jesus. But there are some people who they've met somebody who calls himself a Christian and they were so turned off to the gospel, so turned off to church they didn't want to come back. Anyone can invite, but the church must be a welcoming place. We have this picture we can show you of some folks just standing out in the hallway welcoming people. One of the most important things we can do from the moment people drive onto our campus is to make sure they've got a parking spot, make sure there's somebody there to welcome, welcome them when they get in the hallway. Last week somebody told me that they came to church, they walked in, and they were going to sit down and someone told them, get up, that's my spot. It's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? I mean, after all the sermons I've preached, there's still people who do that. So I want to find out who that was so we can get them up here and we can all have a talking to them about them, right? Because the church is supposed to be what? It's a welcoming place. In fact, Jesus, in this gospel, right before he goes to the cross, he comes to this little town called Jericho. And he's walking through Jericho and he sees, as he often does, a guy in a tree, it's a joke. It only happens once. It's up in the sycamore tree, and his name is Zach, right? Zacchaeus. And Jesus walks up to Zach's sycamore tree, and it says this in the Bible, in Luke 19. It says, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said, Zach, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. I've often read that and thought to myself, I'm so glad it says that and welcomed him gladly. You know what it could have said? It could have said that Simon came down the tree and said, Jesus, I'd love for you to come to my house, but not now, maybe later. Or the cowboys are going to be on TV. Or I've got something going on. The what? The renegades. The Mavericks. The Mavericks. I'm getting all these, like, there's more talk back on sports than anything else in the sermon in history. <laughs> what a laundry. What's our excuse, right? But what it says is Zach, Zacchaeus, he is a wealthy tax collector. He's a big business owner. He's got a lot of transactions going on. But you know what he does? He says, all right, hold all that. I'm going to make time for Jesus. In fact, I'm going to welcome to my house. We're going to have a dinner Here's what I think. I think what God wants us to hear this morning is this. Every time we welcome someone into this church, it's as if we're welcoming Jesus. I mean, he didn't just welcome them with a smile on his face. He welcomed them gladly. If you go home and read Luke 19, you'll see that while they were at dinner, something happened in the heart of Zacchaeus. His life was changed as an encounter with Jesus. And then Jesus says this in Luke 19.10. It's one of the great themes of the gospel. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He came so that you and I and everyone else could find God. That's why he came. And people who found him help people find him. He's interested in people, isn't he? That's the master's plan. I'll tell you something else about the master's plan that we read in this passage to continue the sports analogies, is that he's interested in followers, not fans. Followers, not fans. Right now, the Baylor Bears have a lot of fans. If you're following NCAA basketball sports, they are number one in men and women sports. They have a lot of fans. Last year, when their football team wasn't doing so well, not very many. Let me tell you about fans. Fans show up when you're winning. But when you're losing, they switch the channel. Just ask everybody that used to support the Dallas Cowboys. The memorabilia has come down. Right? Fans are fickle. We follow as long as things are the way they want them, we want it to be. Now, when it comes to God, there are people who are just like that. God, I will follow you when life is easy. I will follow you when things are going my way. I'll go to church if the sun is shining and the birds are singing, the weather is perfect. When I get there, they give me a donut. (laughs) I leave, everybody's nice to me. I don't have to park really far away. 
the temperature is perfect, they don't sing too long, the sermon's not real boring. That's what we do with God, isn't it? That's being a fan. But what we learn in this story is that Jesus is interested in followers. He's interested in people who are committed through thick and through thin. In fact, in John chapter six, Jesus does one of these amazing miracles. We can see this, uh, by the way, show this picture of Jesus teaching here. So many times we see it, there's just crowds. Just imagine all these crowds. Jesus is gonna be feeding all these people in John six. He does this, there's just thousands of people there. And then he says, you know what? You wanna follow me? You gotta take up your cross and follow me. You gotta deny yourself and follow me. You gotta do this and follow me. And the crowds leave. John 6, 64. Yet there are some of you who do not believe and they start leaving. I mean, just by the droves, people stop following Jesus. It says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. They're just fans. They were there for the miracle. He turned to, 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 to the disciples and he said, the 12, you don't want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. And look who answers. Who answers? Who is it? It's Simon Peter, the guy that was in the boat, that left his boat and followed Jesus. Simon Peter answered him. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. If everybody else leaves you, through thick and thin, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm not just a fan. I'm not just there when it's easy. I'm not just there when it's comfortable. I am a follower through thick and thin. Let me tell you something. Anyone can invite someone to church, and I want all of us to do this, but only disciples, only true believers in Jesus can actually witness for Christ. Only when you have a testimony and you can say, Christ came into my life and, my, and I know Jesus and he's my savior, can you then begin to share that witness. Only genuine disciples can witness for him. Now, we have churches in this country with people in them that call themselves Christians. So as I say to you, only disciples can witness, I'm gonna say this to you, most quote unquote Christians never witness. I'm preaching a whole sermon today on a topic called evangelism, helping people find God, and most people in churches across this country who say they believe in this book and call Jesus their savior will never share their faith with anyone. You say, I don't believe that, you're just making it up. Oh, really? I love to be challenged in the middle of my sermon by myself. Because <laughs> I've got statistics. Statistic number one. 70%, this is LifeWay Research, 70% of people who attend church once or more a month, and by the way, that's now regular attending, never share their faith with a stranger. LifeWay Research, 70%. 70% of people who come to church every month never share their faith. Now, if that's true in this room, then that would mean 70% of you never share your faith, LifeWay Research. Statistic number two, Baylor Research. And you know they're right because they're number one in the NCAA polls right now. <laughs> Only 8% of regular church attenders believe that sharing their faith is imp very important. Hmm, I wonder why people don't share their faith. 92% of them don't think it matters, right? If you don't think something's important, you're probably not gonna pay any attention to it. You're probably not going to do it if it's not very important to you. But when you stepped out of the boat and you have started to follow Jesus and you found God and there's a heart now inside of you for others to find God. That shifts from not very important to very important. And you begin to do that. All right, so here's another statistic. Since you wanted to hear more statistics. Almost 50% of Christians think that most people who are not Christians have no interest in hearing about Jesus. This is Barna. You ever heard somebody say, well, I don't think people who aren't Christians want to know about Jesus. That's not true, actually. Did you know that a lot of people, a high percentage of people when they poll them, say that when they go to bed at night, they wonder when they, if they died tonight, will they go to heaven or hell? 
I can remember being a kid, not growing up in church. Every single night of my childhood, wondering if I were to die, where I would go. Wouldn't it be something for you not to have that fear for yourself? And wouldn't that be something for you to help some of your friends and from your family members not to have that fear that they could know that they would know where they would go because they put their faith and their trust in Jesus? Wouldn't that be something? 50% of non of, almost 50% of Christians think that non-Christians have no interest. And here's another statistic. 78% of the people who are not churched say they would listen to someone share what they believed. You ever heard someone say, oh, well, they don't care. Almost 80% say we're waiting for someone to tell us. If you found God, the people that you know that are your friends and they're your family, 78% of them are waiting to hear you share that faith with them. They want to hear about that. They may not admit it, but in their soul, they long for it. There's an emptiness there. And yet, this is the other statistic, number five. Three out of four Christians seldom have a spiritual conversation with anyone. Anyone. 75% of the people who came to our church this morning, of the 700 people who walked onto our campus this morning, 75% of them never have spiritual conversations with anybody. I mean, they don't have spiritual conversations at church. Going to Sunday school classes, sometimes you hear people talk about, well, did you see this? Did you hear this? Did you hear this in the news? And by the way, these donuts aren't good. I mean, 74%. I think I understand what's going on here. There's a spiritual, there's a spiritual problem inside of our, our hearts. 93% of practicing Christians aren't comfortable to have a conversation about the Lord with their own grandchildren. Now, some of you young people, I hope you don't have any grandkids yet. How many of you under the age of 20 have grandchildren? Okay. How many of you have grandchildren here today? Just raise your hand. Look around the room. In the early service, like 80% had grandchildren. <laughs> I didn't ask how many had great or great great. But this is an amazing statistic. 93% of, of grandparents who go to church don't feel comfortable talking to their grandkids about Jesus. I told the story. I said that the last time I saw my grandfather, Clarence Ritzema, Six foot, two, three, big old hands, worked at General Motors all of his life, raised six kids, sent them all to church, sent them all to, to learn about Christ in a Christian school, lived on just nothing, never had a conversation with him where he wasn't sharing his faith with me. The last time I saw him, I remember him putting his big hands around me. And with tears in his eyes, as if he knew he was the last time he was going to see me, he said, David, don't forget, God is your refuge and an ever-present help in time of trouble. He quoted one of the greatest psalms of the Old Testament. It's the last thing my grandfather said to me. A few weeks later, at his funeral, I stood up and I shared that with all of the family. My grandfather never missed an opportunity to pour his spirituality into my life. And I've always thought to myself how sad it would be to be one of those 93% of grandchildren whose grandparents walk into church every Sunday, but they never share their faith with their grandchildren. Not even with their grandchildren. And then here's the last statistic. Two-thirds of all American churches are experiencing no growth and a decline in numbers. Is there any mystery to that? We are living in a country where there is a church on every corner, but there are so few Christians willing to live out their faith because God's not interested in fans. He's looking for followers. Jesus came and turned his back on the crowd and he turned to Peter and he said, I'm gonna make you a fisher of men. You, Peter, you're a nobody from nowhere. I mean, you're just a sinner. All you you do is is, is catch fish, but I'm gonna make you into one of the most powerful evangelists in the history of the world. I'm gonna use you in ways you can't even imagine. 
Peter's like, I'm just a sinner, you can't use me. And God will transform this man because he, is, he was willing to leave behind the boat and follow. And then finally, all of this requires action, not apathy. Jesus did not simply tell Peter this is what you need to do. He expected him to do something about it. Apathy is when we just, okay, you ready for apathy? Apathy is to say this. When somebody asks, you wanna go here, you wanna go there, and you say, meh, right? That's apathy. Meh, I don't care. Apathy is when you, you have the gospel and you know somebody that needs it, but you're just like, they might go to hell, but meh, who cares? I mean, there's fun stuff to do. There's cool stuff on YouTube. Nah. If you look at why this is such a problem in our country, Robert Coleman, who wrote the book, The Master Plan of Evangelism, says that the cause, he, he makes up a word. He says it's affluenza. Now you say, well, what in the world is that? Never heard of that. Is that, is that kind of like the coronavirus? <laughs> affluenza is a made up word. You've heard of influenza. That's the flu. Everybody's gonna get that sooner or later. But affluence means to have a lot of material wealth. If you look at the nations that are in the western part of the world, Europe and America, over the last 50 years, we have accumulated huge amounts of money. We're, we're super rich. We have, I mean, we've got more money and more stuff and more gadgets and more things. We've got more iPhones and iPads and fancy cars and fancy houses and fancy clothes and fancy vacations. We've got so much stuff. Then you track in the same chart the spiritual condition of our country, the, the amount of baptisms in our convention across churches in this country, and it goes down like this. At the same time as we get richer, spiritually we become poorer. And Robert Coleman says if you look at countries with a lot of money, you see virtually no evangelism. Because why do I need God if I got everything that I, that I want with money? For Peter, you see what he had to do? He wasn't a poor man. But he had to leave behind the boat and he had to follow Jesus. There was another guy that made a bad choice in this regard. His, we call him the rich young ruler. And that's just kind of a made up word because the Bible never actually says that. But he, we are told about him in Luke 18. It says, when Jesus heard, heard this, rich young ruler came to Jesus. He said, he asked the question that our world wants to know right now. How can I have eternal life? How can I know that when I die, I'm gonna go to heaven? And the rich young ruler, Jesus told him, he said, obey all the commandments. And he's like, oh, I've already done all that. I don't know about you, but I always imagine Jesus kind of rolling his eyes a little bit. But he didn't, even, he didn't even deal with that. He just said, you know what? You lack one thing. This is Luke 18, 22. Sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Now, we expect that for a person to be given the offer of eternal life from Jesus Christ on earth, they would be like, yes, I'm a ruler. I'm young. I can make more money. It's not what happens. This is what it says. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. You see, affluenza is not a modern problem. It's just a human problem. Anything in our life that keeps us from being able or being willing to follow God in helping people find God can be a cause of that. There's another story that I think of is in Mark 4. Jesus is talking about farmers throwing seed out in the ground and he uses it as a parable. And in Mark 4 he says, 4, 16, some of the seed landed on rocky places and they'd hear the word and receive it with joy, but they had no root, and it only lasted for a short time. Some people will hear the gospel, and they'll be like, yeah, I'm gonna follow Jesus, and then a week later, they're not. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they fall away. Still others, he says, is like seed among thorns. You hear the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things comes in and chokes the word, making it unfruitful. What we have to be careful of is not allowing some of those things to distract us from being productive. 
Here's the thing, if you have found God, you're to help people find God. And what you've got to do is you've got to hold back some of those thorns in your life and go, okay, I'm not going to let what could just be fun distract me from what is important, which is sharing my faith. The worries of life, the fun of life, the distractions of life, the desires of life, if we're not careful, we'll spend all our time doing stuff we want to do and we'll miss out on what we're supposed to do. We'll spend all of our time doing what's fun and we'll, as a result, become apathetic to the needs for people to find God in our life. What is the cure for this? It's simple, it's Christ, isn't it? All through scripture. You know, I'd, I, would, uh, I would be remiss today, if you know that word, that means I, w- I would have missed out on something really important. If I didn't preach this sermon and say, God wants all of us who have found Christ to help other people find him. He wants all of us to leave the boats and follow him and help others find him. But maybe you're here today and you've never found him. Maybe there's, never, maybe there's not a point in your life where you can say, I put my faith and my trust in Jesus. I, I've trusted him as my Savior and my Lord. When we talk to kids, sometimes we'll just say it like this. We'll say, you know, it's, it's ABCs. You admit to God that you're a sinner. You believe that Jesus Christ died for you. And then you confess that he's your Lord. You trust him with your life. I'm going to ask if you would just to bow your head. Father, as I've uh, preached this message today, to all of us in this room who are Christians, people who have found God in our life and been called to be people who help others find God, I pray, God, that you would put a passion in our heart to do that. But Lord, this morning, even as I say this, even as people are watching this, even as people are sitting here today, maybe there's someone or some ones who if they're honest with themselves, they know they have never truly made that commitment in their life. And God, maybe this morning you're just speaking to their heart saying, I can't put it off any longer. I can't wait any longer. I, I've got to do this. I've got to make this decision. It's now or it's never. Now is... Now is the moment I've got to take the courage to step forward and say, today's the day I want to trust Jesus. Today's the day I want to follow Jesus. I don't want to be a fan anymore. I don't want to just watch anymore. I don't want to just sit on the sidelines anymore. I don't want to just hear about it anymore. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready to begin to follow Jesus in my life and to help other people find God. God, move in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand with me this morning, I'll be here at the front. The Lord's leading you. You come as we sing.